Blog Talk Radio. Me chamo Afura Anu Kai Neye Akanfo Nara Songa. Me dinde Ojirafo Kwesi Rade Hampata Akan. Akwamu Mine Amaruka Etiki Mu Ojirafo. Ojira Mine Mu. Greetings to all Afrikani Afurai Kaitni people, meaning Africans, black people today. Akanfo Nana Song Day. Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion Day. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Ranehm Pata Akan. Ojirafo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojiramai, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast once again. We are opening up the chat room. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, interact in the chat room. You must log in as a user in order to interact. If you don't have a username, you, you can sign up for one quickly and blog talk in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one. You can see that your hand is raised and then we can connect with you on the phone line. So we're going to reopen that room real quick, see if that's working out. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanfo Nana Som, Ancient Authentic Akanfo on Juda on Monday nights, on Benanda, Abinanda week, Tuesday nights. We have Ojida, which means purification. Second, we want to make sure this chat room is opening up. And they've been having a little bit of a problem with the chat room for a for a number of months. As a matter of fact, I'm going to reboot that one more time. So on Benada, Abinada, Tuesday night, we have Ujida, which is purification. We deal with ancestral religion in general not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion in general and how it impacts every aspect of our lives. Ancestral religion, or Afurakani, Afurakani or African ancestral religion, in essence, is ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. Through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of the law, the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We say Ojida, or purification, operationalizes Nanasong. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring balance in our lives. It is this, in this manner, by this means, that we are able to execute our function in creation, align ourselves with our culture. Our culture is the divine acceptance, the love of order, and the divine rejection, the divine hate repulsion of disorder and its pervasiveness. So we accept and incorporate that which is harmonious, and we reject that which is out of with divine order. That allows us to execute our function every moment of every day. We seek to align every thought, intention, and action every moment of every day with divine order. We make mistakes that are legitimate, and we engage the ritual process to ritually incorporate divine law and ritually restore divine balance so that we can realign ourselves realign our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and continue to function, execute our divine function and creation. On uh, Wukuda Akuda Wednesday night, we have Egua Marketplace, where we showcase Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions who are serving the Afurakani Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who have maintained their ancestral religious values in the context of their service to the community. So we've had a number of individuals come onto the show, showcase their businesses, organizations, and institutions. We have a list of those businesses, organizations, and institutions as well. 
um, a growing list and so forth. So we'll be bringing more businesses, organizations, and institutions on. Part of that process is our Ocon economic development model, where we we publish that that document. You can download that. That's a free publication where we approach economic development from an ancestral religious perspective. We approach economic development rooted in our ancestral values, so it's a holistic approach to economic development. One of the strategies we use in that model is what we call starve the beast and feed the pride. That means you make an assessment on a weekly basis to determine what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then you starve the beast and feed the pride. You reallocate those funds away from the white business and direct them to the business organization or institution of the week. And we have been targeting one Afurakani, Afurakani business organization or institution per week. So when you reallocate 10 or $15 from a white business to the black business, that's a transfer of capital. When a thousand people engage that process, that's a transfer of 10 or $15,000 from white businesses directly into the accounts black businesses, business organization or institution, which allows them to hire within that same week when they generate $10,000 in revenue. Within the course of seven days, they can hire permanently from the community within the business. They can serve at that greater capacity, expand their products and services to us. If we do not engage that process, then by default, hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring, by default, we must starve the beast and feed the pride on a consistent basis, on a weekly basis, daily basis. This is what we deal with on Yada, which is Thursday, also called Yada Abada Thursday. We have affairs of the nation, and what we deal with on that show is approaching the various issues that confront us as Afurakani, Afurakani people, grounded, perspective, rooted in Afurakani, Afurakani, nationalism, which is the purification of nationalism. So we have a nationist approach to solving every problem that confronts us, overcoming every obstacle or perceived obstacle that confronts us. So we deal with that um, on Yalda, Thursday night, on Amain Sim, Affairs of the Nation. So, for those who came in uh, later, if you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly in blog talk. If you want to uh, comment on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. All right, so, one of the announcements that we have uh, we sent out a couple of emails regarding our Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, which is coming up on March 12th here in Washington, D.C., Ancestral Religious Reversion. We're going to be dealing with this. is our second annual conference. It's a free conference all day, open to Afrakani, Afrakani people only, of course. Um, we will have presentations on our ancestrally inherited religious practices born of our blood circles that we have preserved right here in North America. We are not dependent on anyone outside of our blood circles to give us ancestral religion. We maintain them intergenerationally and transcarnationally for centuries right here in our blood circles in America. So we'll be having Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau out of New Orleans dealing with voodoo, ancestral voodoo that has been maintained for hundreds of years in the Louisiana area prior to the Haitian migration into Louisiana. Voodoo was already in Louisiana. We're going to have Mama Mawusi Ashakir dealing with juju, which is the Yoruba tradition as maintained in the blood circles of our people for hundreds of years in North America. When Yoruba people were forced over here, they continued their practice of Yoruba tradition, the Orisha tradition, under the terms or term juju. She'll be dealing with that tradition. We will be dealing with who do the Akan ancestral religion maintained in the blood circles of our people here in North America. And we will probably have one more um, as well. 
where we will have our vendor um, space at Gua Marketplace, you, vendors all day long, supporting black businesses and so forth. And of course, we'll have presentations throughout the day. So it's a family event. Registration is required. Registration is free. You can go to our ojidamind.spruce.com uh, site to register, but you can go to the Etchy Sign and Sustry Religious Reversions page on our website for all details. That includes, um, we sent out a few emails. We've been talking about this for the past few weeks. Um, this is the deadline. We've come to the end of January, so this is the deadline for those of you who would like to submit your uh, ads for your, to be in the journal. We're publishing the Etchy Sign and Such Religious Reversion Journal. It'll be released on the day of the conference, given away for free to all conferees. And we will also have that book, ebook version, on our website permanently. We will also sell the soft cover version, but the ebook version will be on our website permanently. So when you place your ad in our journal for your business, organization, or institution, over the past 12 months, we've had 3.1 million hits on our website so when, and thousands of book downloads for the free books. So when, when you place your ad in our, in our journal, then hundreds of thousands of, people, of our people will see the ad. So this is the deadline to submit those JPEG files. When you go to our Itchy Sign page on the website, you will see um, all of the details, a one-quarter page ad, $25. A half page ad is 35, a full page ad is 50. It's an eight and a half by 11 journal, full color. So all of the details are there. This is the deadline. We've been sending out some emails and posting on Facebook for those who have shown some interest, but we are at the deadline now because we need to begin to format and get the publication ready. So we'll be ready in time for the conference ahead of time. We have to get it ready first. And of course, we have to go to print. So we need everything in now, this is the deadline. This is the end of January. So we've been sending those emails out for the past couple of days. So ASAP, go to the Etsy sign page for that. The other announcement is we've been also sending out emails and posting. We're working on our documentary film, Amarukapo Adebisa Adjumadi, which is translated as African-American Ancestral Divination Project. Documentary film will be documenting the oracular divination systems that we have maintained here in North America, in our blood circles in North America, in the voodoo tradition, in the juju tradition, in the hoodoo tradition, in the wanga tradition, in the ngangan tradition, and so forth. So we're going to have voodoo queen Galinda Lavoe and Mama Mawusi Ashakir and Wabet Seshat to Akwajet and Rakit Kajara Niya Nebethet. You'll see we created the first trailer for the film. It is out. It's about nine minutes. We posted it on Facebook and on our website as well, on our YouTube page as well. So it's been circulating. Many people like what they've seen. Um, we also have a crowdfunding page link for that. We're trying to raise the funds because we're plan to start filming in February, in like mid-February, going to the different sites where people's ancestral shrines are going to their cities to film on location. So all of the details are on the crowdfunding site. Yet I say we thank you to those who have contributed to make this film happen. If you like the trailer, if you like the work we're doing, if you downloaded any of our 24 books, been impacted in a positive way, you can go to the Amaka Adebisa Adjumani site, the fundraiser.com, F U N D R A Z R.com slash Amaru Kapo underscore Adebisa. You'll see that on the link on Facebook and so forth, and we'll po post it in the chat room and contribute to that. We're trying, we're at 3% of our fundraising goal. We've had 25 contributors over the past 17 days when we first started. We're at 3% of the goal when we, we need to get to about 20% of the entire fundraising goal so we can begin the filming process to begin the travel, get the specific equipment, the documentary film camera type equipment that we need, as well as to travel to the first couple of cities to begin filming on location. So once we get to that 20% mark, we can start the process and the goal is to begin that process in early 
February. So we're only at 3% right now. So if you support the work that we're doing, this is the time to show your support by making a contribution. And of course, you can receive books in return for your uh, contribution. Information, the subject for tonight, and tonight's show, of course, is Akanto Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. So we have a show specifically dealing with Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestral Religion. Number one, because we are Akan. Number two, because of the misinformation that's been propagated regarding Akan religion, spirituality, cosmology, not only coming from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also those on the continent in Ghana, Ivory Coast, who have been infected with white culture, with pseudo-religion, Christianity, Islam, and so forth. And therefore, their presentation of the culture has been infected as well. Their presentation of the cosmology has been infected as well, whether they're traditional, quote-unquote, priests to priestesses, if they're PhDs, no matter what it is. If they've been infected by white culture, whether through pseudo-religious organizations, or through the university and so forth, and they've incorporated those infections into the fabric of the culture, then what they speak through the language and so forth sounds like it's traditional, but in reality has been corrupt. So we're talking about ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion, going back to ancient Kanat, a title of Nubia. Our people migrated from ancient Kanat, the Khan land, migrated west, reestablished ourselves in the empire of Kana or Ghana, a couple of thousand years ago, hundreds of years later, some of our people migrated further south towards the region of today's Ghana and Ivory Coast and reestablished Akana civilization. And then hundreds of years after that, some of our people were taken from those regions as prisoners of war and forced into the Western Hemisphere in North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the enslavement era. But we maintained our ancestral religious traditions. Thus, the Akan tradition in Suriname is called Winti. The Akan tradition in Jamaica is called Obia. The Akan tradition in North America is called Hudu, from the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. Undu also means to become heavy with the spirit, spirit possession. It means that in the Akan language, it means that in the language of ancient Kanit, Nubia, and Kemet, we've proven that in our book, Hoodoo People, you'll find that Undu means medicine from plant life as well as mineral life. In the language of ancient Kemet, Undu also means become heavy, dealing with becoming heavy with the spirit. The same definitions in Akan today and the exact same definitions in North America. Hoodoo meaning root work, root medicine, who do also becoming heavy with the spirit to prepare that medicine, spirit possession to communicate with the deities and ancestral spirits and so forth. So for healing as well as killing, for self-defense, offense and so forth, protection and so forth. So this is why we deal with ancient authentic Akan ancestral religion, which includes who do. We've had a number of broadcasts proving different aspects of the tradition. We prove Undu. That very term hudu has been used for thousands of years up until this moment. We maintain that term. We've talked about the term kanjur, which is really kanche, the akan term, kanche, meaning to utter incantations, bring down the spirits. We continue to use that term kanche, and the whites in their offspring thought we were saying kanje or kanjur, but we were saying kanche, and in the southern dialect saying kanje, the exact same term. So un- and Kanche in the Akan language became Hudu and Kanje in a southern dialect here, meaning the exact same things. And the term Kanche can also be found in ancient Kemet, meaning the exact same thing. We proved that in the hieroglyphs and so forth in our book as well. And we've gone through a number of different broadcasts, over 20 plus broadcasts with different aspects of the tradition, the Hudu tradition proving that they can only be properly defined in the context of our Khan language, culture, and cosmology. Hudu is not a mixture of pseudo-European folk magic, pseudo-Native American, pseudo-spirituality, or a combination of various 
African ethnic groups who all amalgamated to create tradition or a manufactured tale about ancient Black Americans meeting, you know, Africans coming from the continent and them blending their culture and creating hoodoo. That's all nonsense. It's all manufactured and made up. Hoodoo is the Akan ancestral religion carried in the blood circles of Akan people and perpetuated in this hemisphere. This use of hoodoo being a catch-all term for just any ancestral religion is a recent phenomenon promoted by the whites and their offspring. Now, the same is true for this notion of High John the Conqueror. We're talking about the origin, the Akan origin of quote unquote High John the Conqueror, the man himself, and the root revealed. It's the most popular ubiquitous root utilized in the tradition. Some people think that, quote unquote, High John the Conqueror was just a mythological figure representing our resilience against enslavement. Very often that's the whites in our spring talking or misinformed black academics or pseudo academics trying to rationalize why we utilize a spiritual figure and so forth. Then some will say that High John the Conqueror was an African prince who was enslaved. And when he was enslaved and forced over here, he was never able to be controlled by the whites and their offspring. And because he was never able to be controlled, he would always overtake and, and come out on top. He led a rebellion against the whites and their offspring. And when he was killed, he said that my spirit will go back to Afuraka, Afuraka, go back to Africa, but my energy will be placed in this root, and if you ever need me, then you can utilize this root and evoke my energy and so forth, the power of my spirit and so forth, I will come and protect and defend you and assist, assist you in whatever you need. So this is the story, and the basic story in reality is accurate. Some people thought he came from Angola or somewhere in the Congo. People not knowing exactly where he came from. And then, as we said, some of the academics will say that, hey, he, he, this is just a mythological figure that we manufactured in our imagination to help us feel strong and resilient. And he became a trickster type figure and all, all of this other nonsense. In reality, he did exist. He is an Akan ancestor. He's one of our direct blood relatives. We know exactly where he came from what nation he came from, what year he came, and so forth. And then we're going to get into the root itself. So first we're going to deal with his identity, his Akan identity, and then we're going to deal with the identity of the original root that's being talked about and then the substitute that's being used. So first we're going to talk about the origin of the man himself. Now, one of the first great rebellions in the Western Hemisphere before the Haitian Revolution, which is one of the greatest because they actually took over the entire island. You had a number of different groups who established maroon settlements, some small maroon set settlements and some large maroon settlements like the Quilombo in Brazil and so forth. But the largest uh, revolt as far as taking over an entire nation, entire island, the largest one was the Haitian Revolution. That's in the late, quote unquote, 1700s, 1791 onward until um, the early 1801 and 1802 and so forth. But prior to that, 60 years prior to that, the largest war and rebellion that was successful for a while was what they called the Rebellion of St. John's. St. John's Island in the today's Virgin Islands. Back then it was the quote unquote Danish West Indies. So-called 1733, 12,733 in the real calendar, in the Gregorian calendar, 1733. So let's talk about that 
get this kind of information anywhere about the slave insurrection of 1733 in Saint, on St. Saint John's Island. The Danish West Indies started on November 23rd, 1733. Our people from the Aquamu region, from Aquamu Mine, the Aquamu Nation. So when you hear us talk about Aquamu Mine and Marukai Tivu, the Aquamu Nation in North America, the Aquamu is a subgroup of the larger Akan ethnic group. The Akan ethnic group is the largest ethnic group in Ghana and our coast. About 45% of the population of Ghana is Akan. About 42% of the population of Ivory Coast is Akan. Collectively, there are over 20 million Akan people between Ghana and Ivory Coast. Of course, those borders didn't exist a few hundred years ago, separating those territories. It's one of the largest groups in not only West Africa, Africa, but one of the largest groups on the continent. The Akwamu is a subgroup of the Akan ethnic group. Many people have heard of the Asante, which is the largest Akan group. The next, the second largest Akan group is the Fanti. And then you have other groups like the Denchera, the Akwamu, the Bono, and various others. In quote unquote 1733, in Saint, on St. John's Island, which is now one of the U.S. Virgin Islands, but back then it was the Danish West Indies, November 23rd. Afurakani, Afurakani people who were Akwamu revolted against the owners and managers of the plantations. It lasted for over six months. They took over the entire island. Prior to that, they had a number of maroon settlements, but they conspired, they planned, they organized, they waged war, they massacred the Achiwadiefo, the whites and their offspring, the spirits of disorder, and they took over the whole island. And they held the island down for months, from November of quote unquote 1733 all the way into June, before the White Snarl Spring got other reinforcements from other islands to come all come together and attack and put down the rebellion. Part of it, the reason why it was put down is because there was a split within the ranks, within our people. And that goes back to what was taking place prior to the rebellion, prior to us even you know, getting to the Western part of the Western Hemisphere. So here's the key. We're going to get some detailed information about who are these people who are Akwamu who started this rebellion. Now, the Akwamu people, as we said, one of the largest groups back in the so-called 1500s and into the 1600s, they became, in the latter part of the 16th, they became the largest, most powerful Akan empire at that time. They, had a, they were a great military power. They had great influence between the mid-1600s into the late 1600s and into the early 1700s. They were the major Akan empire. They were ruling trade and everything else. They also got into skirmishes with other Afurakani, Afurakani groups, like the Guan people, as well as the Ga and Adangbe people and so forth. And they were able to maintain some control over certain groups. Now, there was a civil war within Akwamu. They started losing some of their power. Some of the vassal states that they were controlling broke away. The group that became known as the Equia Pem group, the thousand groups and so forth, Equia or Akoa groups, subjects, and Apem means thousand. The Equia Pem people, they were primarily Guan speaking people who were um, living under the control of the Aquamu people. They wanted to break away. They weren't strong enough to break away, but they asked another Akan group, the Achim Akan people, to assist them. So the Achim people, who were at odds with the Aquamu anyway. There's one Akan group who were at odds with the other Akan group. The Achim and the Aquamu were at odds anyway. The Achim helped the Guan people. They banded together, as well as other disaffected Aquamu. They created a coalition, and they attacked the Aquamu Empire. And the Aquamu Empire collapsed. They were attacked from all sides. The nobles and others, were captured as prisoners of war, and they were sold into enslavement. 
at the time, there was Christiansborg Castle on the coast of Ghana. It was controlled by the Danes, the people from Denmark called the Danes, the Danish people controlled by the Danes, the same Danish people who had taken control of St. John's Island, St. Thomas, and St. Croix at the time. So let's get into some true history. Let's back up a little bit. In 1732, and this is from a book built called The Cloth of Many Colored Silks, Papers on the History and Society, Ghanaian, and so forth. I will go at length, but you can find this information in different places. In 1732, the Countess of Larwig, which is the name of the ship or vessel, arrived in the Danish Caribbean with 115 slaves. So the Danes were on the coast of Ghana, today's Ghana. One of their ships left in June of 1732. The ship was called the Countess of Larwig, arrived in the Danish Caribbean with 115 slaves. The majority were Aquamu. In May of 1733, the Larberg Galley, which was the name of another ship, reached St. Thomas with 242 individuals. St. Thomas Island and St. John Island, their sister islands, they're about four miles apart. They were part of the Danish holdings in the Caribbean. So they would bring the people to St. Thomas, and then they would transfer some them over four miles away to St. John's and so forth. And here's the reason. So in May 1733, the Larberg Galley, which is the name of the ship, reached St. Thomas with 242 individuals. They left the Danish Christianborg, Christiansborg Castle in Ghana. They took enslaved Akamu people, prisoners of war. And in May, they landed on St. Thomas Island with 242 individuals. 124 men, 64 women, 26 boys, and 28 girls. Most of these slaves, quote unquote, ended up on St. John's, four miles away. Nearly all were Aquamu. Among them was a man known on St. John's Island as King June. King June, pronounced in the Danish dialect, is Kung. Jomni or Jom, he was the main organizer and leader of the uprising in 1733 when they took over the whole island. King Jom became known as King John. This is quote unquote High John the Conqueror. This is King John who was a royal from Aquamu who was captured as a prisoner of war when the Aquamu uh, nation empire collapsed. As a result of the wars, they were captured. The royal class was captured. He was captured along with other princes, but also in 1733 when he was captured. And it's all documented. The names of the people were captured. There were 242 individuals that landed in St. Thomas in May of 1733. 124 men, 64 women, 26 boys, and 28 girls. One of them was King Joan as they call him, King John, but we're going to get into what his name really is. He was the main organizer and leader of the uprising of the rebellion later on in that year, in November, but this was May when he arrived. All the above slaves were purchased at Christiansborg Castle in June 1732. So they purchased them in 1732 in June. Eventually they left months later, and they arrived in the Caribbean in May of 1733. And in this book, they say they probably represented the last ditch stand of the armed Aquamu opposition. In 1732 to 1733, as we said, the Achim military forces carried out a series of campaigns against the scattered pockets of resistance and sold those captured to the Danes and other European traders. To recap, the Aquama was a major empire. It became really powerful in around 1650 all the way through 1730, but that's when they lost their power. Sometimes they were 
oppressive with regard to the vassal states that they were controlling and levying taxes and different things like that, and the different groups didn't like the way they were being treated by the Akwamu. They were very heavy-handed in certain regard. In a certain regard, they were heavy-handed with the Guan people, who are non-Akan people, even though they're related distantly, but they're their own ethnic group, the Guan G U A N. They they were controlling them. They were controlling some of the Ga people, spelled G A, the Ga as well as Adangbe people. And those people organized. They organized, and they asked the other Akan military power, the Achim to assist them because they knew the Achim people were powerful as a military um, force and they were probably the only other Akan group that could handle the Akwamu military. So they asked them to join them. The Achim joined them. They led the opposition, the coalition with the Guan and the Ga and Adangbe, all of them together, took on the Akwamu empire, the Akwamu military, and defeated them. So the Akwamu, the great Akwamu empire that had been developing since the late 1400s into the 1500s and became very powerful, they finally collapsed because of disintegration and a coalition against them. And the Achim, who were leading the coalition, their military forces, as it says, carried out a series of campaigns against the scattered pockets of resistance and sold those captured to the Danes, the Christian board, Christian's board castle right there on the coast of Ghana, the Danes took them, as well as other European traders, but in this context, for our purposes, the Danes took the Akwamu um, prisoners of war and took them to the Danish West Indies, to St. Thomas and St. John. In 1733, the Danish West Indies comprised three islands. St. Thomas purchased in 1672, but not developed into a regular plantation colony until 1688. St. John purchased in 1675 and St. Croix purchased in 1733. It was not until 1715 that concerted efforts were made to establish plantations on St. John, and these continued throughout the 1720s. This activity depended on regular supplies of slave labor from the Guinea coast. The political revolution of the Equiapem people, which was the coalition of the Achim and the Guan and the Ga and Adangbe, that coalition, their revolution, was therefore something of a boon to the St. John economy, meaning that because they coalesced and attacked the Aquamu Empire and captured some of their prisoners of war, then they were able to sell them to the Danes, and the Danes took those people and took them to St. John's Island that was just trying to develop into a plantation island, and they were able to receive their slave labor, and then that was a boon to the St. John economy. It produced hundreds of potential laborers, of course, so by 1733, the island had 109 sugar plantations, a dozen or so sugar mills, 208 whites and 1,087 slaves, so-called St. John Lax Town. It had a small fort called Frederick's Fort or Fortsburg. According to Anderson, the St. John slave population included five princes, a nobleman, one princess, and one king. Most of them were Akwamu. Before their defeat by the revolution of the Equiapem group, their careers and social identities had been one with a century and a half old state building tradition and political culture. There were at least three Maroon small settlements on the island as well. The Maroons were quote unquote Aminas, and that just that's a title that the Europeans use because they called the castle. The Portuguese called the castle the mine or El Mina, the mine, and they started calling the people in the area El Minas or Minas, and then the Europeans started calling them Aminas, but in reality, they were talking about a Khan speaking people. So, start talking about different true stories of the, of the peace and so forth, but the key is the Aquamu royalty, some of the royalty were taken, same forces and so forth. Then they were uh, transferred to the Danish West Indies. Now we're going to get into some other specifics. I'm going to scroll down real quick. And we just wanted to read a couple of things here just so you can get some details. 
They listed a, a num- the names of the different people. You will find these records in the Christiansborg records kept by the Danes in Ghana, but then also the Danish West Indies, West Indian and Guinea Company and so forth that was running their ships and so forth. They had their records, they had their logs and so forth, and they were talking about the names of the kings and the princes and the noble people, they listed them out. And you look at the records in the Danish West Indian and Guinea Company, and then look at the records in the Christian Spore Castle in Ghana, you're talking about the exact same people. They can tell you the names of the people who they picked up in the castle in Ghana, how old they were, how many of them, they're men and women, how many children, males and females and so forth, what their positions were when they were in uh, Kwame Nation and then when they were transferred. So we're going to scroll down a little bit. I want to give direct information. On the 23rd of November, 1733, the council meeting of the civil authorities of Charlotte, Amelia, St. Thomas. So St. Thomas, again, is four miles from St. John. These are sister islands. The people who were enslaved, they first disembarked from the vessel on St. Thomas. Some of them remained on St. Thomas. Some of them were taken four miles over to the developing sugar plantations on St. John. But the capital was on St. Thomas, four miles away, because they were sister islands. So the capital of the Danish holding was Charlotte, Amelia, that was the name of the capital, on the St. Thomas Isle. There was a meeting of civil authorities in the capital, Charlotte, Amelia, on November 23rd, 1733. It was a council meeting. But it was abruptly interrupted when a soldier from Frederick's Fort burst into the meeting room and handed the governor a letter. Its contents were read aloud to the council. This is the letter itself. With distress, quote, with distress, we wish to inform you that the companies, Soons, Hendricksons, Soapmans, and Peter Kruger's blacks have seized the fort and killed all the people, all of the people together with Soapmans, Kent's, and Becker's children, Moth's overseer, Kruger's wife, and also many more. We all are in danger of our lives, for they are drawing much nearer to us. We therefore implore you to send help as soon as possible, and we hope you will not leave us in anxiety, as we are in very great distress. All of the men who could be assembled are gathered at Durlow's plantation, where we await your assistance, and we have each killed one of the rebels. So they came four miles over from St. John. They rushed over to St. Thomas Island where the capital was. There was a meeting going on. And they said, the Aquamu have waged war. They have killed men, women, and children. We are are in fear for our lives. If you don't send us some help, some reinforcements, we're going to all be massacred. One valuable source of information on the early stages of the rebellion from the 23rd of November to the 4th of December, 1733, is a report by Pierre J. Panet, a French planter on the island of St. Thomas. He emphasized that careful planning went into the execution of the rebellion, and quote, this is what he said, the Negroes were meeting at night to plot at their ease without anyone being able to stop them or to imagine that these meetings would lead to their, that is, the planter's total ruin. The general scheme was to take the planters completely by surprise, kill them, or drive them from the island, and then take control of it. Who were the participants of the rebellion? Oldendorf relates that the rebellion, the rebels came from the Amina tribe, which in, in that language means the Akan, specifically the Akwamu. And they have a list from the different articles, the different sources from the Christiansborg Castle, as well as the Danish records and so forth. And they list all the different names. Abedo is one of the names. He was a Kwamu nobleman. Apinda, which is Apinti, a nobleman. Um, Akwashie, prince of the, of the way they spelled it, of the Akwambo tribe, meaning the Akwamu tribe on the Adrian plantation. Asari, um, King Bolombo, or King Class, the king of the Adangbe tribe in Africa on the Sum plantation. Kanta, a lesser nobleman of the Amina tribe, meaning the Akan, and assistant to the foreman of the Carolina plantation, Odo Kwesi from the Susanaburg plantation, another Kwesi from the Annaburg plantation, Kontomba, Asa, which is a medicine man, 
quote unquote witch doctor, and Kamina, a slave on the Carolina plantation, Kompa, a medicine man, a witch doctor, Kamina on the Carolina company plantation, Accra on the Korger plantation, Adu on the Sultman plantation, Tiyamba on the Horn plantation, Bragatsu on the Carolina company plantation, Akubo, Bombo, Sepuse, Otri, Kofi, all these different people that they had uh, laid out. Then they laid out names of the women who were participating, Brefu, Judicia, and Akweshiba, which is Akweshiba, which is another name of Akosuya, and Akwambo princess, or Akwamu princess, Braka Atu Buakuba. This, this is the actual documentation at the time written by the people that people you can still reference now. The principal leader of the uprising, King Jun, was said to have been, quote unquote, a chief in Africa. He became a slave and foreman on the Sultman plantation. Because of his leadership qualities, he rose through the ranks very quickly and became a leader on the plantation. And they put him as a leader, as a foreman on the plantation. He was not able to be controlled by the plantation owners, but they saw his leadership capacity, so they felt like they better allow him to lead as opposed to, in, in their minds, maybe if he got some leadership position, he wouldn't try to go against them. So they weren't able to control him, so they, they placed him as a foreman on the plantation. King, they knew that he was a chief in Africa. They knew who they were taking from Africa, Afuraka Afraikai, because they knew who the Akwamu people were. They knew the chiefs that they, they captured and so forth. Now, who was quote unquote King John, Queen June or Queen King John? What is his name? His actual Akwamu name, King Jun's Akwamu name was Jamma. Came the actual name is N Y A M M A. Jamma Jamma becomes Jamma in Akan, depending on the dialect. Jamma or Jamma and Jam, and that was corrupted by the whites into John, and the way they pronounce it, Jun, in in the Danish dialect. And then they write it like the June, the month June, but it's Jun. It's a corruption of jam, what jam, the root jamma in Akan. So when they show jamma, he says Gardelin, one of the people writing at the time, for example, uses both names in his reports on the uprising. Who is jamma? Meaning jamma. His name appears with some regularity in the Christiansborg documents of the 1720s when he was still in Ghana, when he was still part of the Akwamu nation. He is always referred to as an important dignitary. The earliest reference to him, this is King John or Joan, really Jamma Njama, when he was still on the continent, he was a royal. Earliest reference to him while he was still on the continent, the 1725 document. There he was described as the king's servant. That is, he was a member of the royal court in other documents, he is regularly described as a what they would call a kabusir, that is an obrempong, a designation that indicates he was a person of rank at the court. A prominent royal servant, he had several responsibilities. It had to do with tax collection, representing the king, the akwamu hini, which is the akwamu king and so forth. A number of things dealing with that, trusted with regard to that. He served as the king's trading agent, the Akwamu Hini's trading agent at Christiansborg Castle. He also traded at Christiansborg Castle on his own account. Little did he know that a few years later he would be sold into enslavement from Christiansborg Castle. But he was actually regulating trade when the Akwamu was still in control as a representative, a top representative of the Akwamu Hini, the king collecting fines whenever the king imposed them on different tributary or tributary coastal towns on the Danish trading station. And he served as the king's trading agent at Christiansborg Castle and traded in his own account. When the rebellion broke out in 1729 to 730 in the Akwamu Empire, meaning when the Guan and the Achim and the Ga and Adangbe, the coalition came together to attack the Akwamu Empire. 
in Jama, Fort Jama, commanded a military force of between 1,000 and 2,000 men in defense of Christiansborg in his role as a military commander of the Royal Bodyguard. He was described in Danish report as one of the king's most distinguished lieutenants. In this book, they say presumably he was an Owura from and held a command position in the Kwamu army. He was one of the Asafo. Osafo means warrior. Osa means war. Safo means warrior. He was Asafo Henni. He was the chief Henni or king of the Asafo. Just like here you have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You have the Secretary of Defense. You have generals who are leading the charge and so forth, and they answer to the president. There you have the Akwamu Henni, the Akwamu king. You have the Akwamu Hema, the queen mother. But then when they have military conflict, they have a general. The leader of all the Asafo, the warriors, is the Asafo Hini, the warrior, Asafo or soldier, Asafo Hini king, the king of the warriors, the quote-unquote general, and so forth. He was, the, according to the Danish reports, Njama or Jama will later be called King John but in, in the Caribbean, once he was forced in the Caribbean. He was the most distinguished lieutenant of the Akwamu Hini. Now, then they talk about some of the other uh, individuals who were with him in Aquamu before they got snatched up and taken away. So, in fact, before we we don't we don't even have to go through because they, they're just going to mention uh, the various names of the other different people that we listed, what their positions were when they were in the Aquamu Nation, and then once they were forced into enslavement, taken on the ships of the Danish West Indian and Guinea Company and forced into the Danish holdings on first St. Thomas and then a few miles away on St. John, then they were showing the comparison. When they were royals in the Akwamu court and so forth, and Njama was the Asafo Hini, the warrior king, he was the head of the warrior class, the greatest lieutenant entrusted by the Alpamu the king to wage war and so forth. But when he was snatched up and forced in 1733 into first St. Thomas and then a few miles over to St. John's Island, then the people recognized him already because they were all, most of them were Akwamu, some of them were Ga and Idambe and so forth. Most of them were Akwamu, a couple of other groups as well. They already knew that he was an Ohenni. They knew he was a military leader, so they elevated him to that position. And he was the leader of the greatest war against the white offspring at that time where they took over a whole island. As we said, there was maroonage on the various islands, St. John, St. Thomas, and so forth, as well as all over the Caribbean and different places. This was the first instance on a mass scale where a group decided to take over the whole island, not just be maroons, to take over the whole island, and they were going to create their own nation, just like 60 years later, they actually did that and affected it in Haiti. But the first ones who attempted it and were successful for the first six to seven months were the coalition led by the Akwamu king. He became the king, the Asafu Hini, the warrior king, and so forth. King Jamma or King Jam, which the white snarls called King John or King John. That's key. So they talk about a few other people. Now, here's the key. When they talk about John the Conqueror, High John the Conqueror, what they're talking about is His Highness John the Conqueror, the king or the Ohenni, the leader, John who was the conqueror, the military king. They said he was an African prince. They thought he, maybe he came from Angola. He came from the Congo. Maybe he came from somewhere else, and then he was brought here, or he was a mythical figure. This is King Jamma, who the white Sinatrain became called King Joan, the way they pronounced it, King Joan in the Danish dialect. Written in English as King Joan, but the way they pronounced it, King Joan. This is Joan, who was literally John the conqueror, conquered the crackers, took over the whole island, 
that had never happened since enslavement had begun. That was the first time that that had happened since they started enslavement in, six, in the so-called 1600s when it really jumped off. And this is why they, they wrote that letter. They were in fear for their lives. We had already massacred men, women, and children. We weren't playing. So King Njama or Jama is John the Conqueror. What's the next piece they say with regard to High John the Conqueror? They said that when he uh, died after the rebellion and so forth, he said that his spirit would enter into that plant, that root. And once his spirit into that root, even though his spirit, when he died, would leave and go back to his country in Afuraka, Afuraikaet, but he would leave his energy in that spirit. He would communicate with the people. So all you had to do is evoke him and utilize that plant for your protection and so forth. You would have the same powerful energy of resistance and so forth, whether it was through illness or politically through your enemies to overcome your enemies. Is there any precedent for that with regard to King John or Jamma? First, one of the reasons, and they'll list this here in this book and many other books, the Whites and Arrow Spring did not like to bring what in some uh, English texts, we call them the Kuromantes because some of them, they took them from the Kuromanti fort in Kuromanti, Ghana. So they'll say the Kuramantes, but that's just a euphemism for Akan. Uh, the Danes would call them the Aminas because they were around the Elmina port. And they'll just say that people from that region, the Elmina, and they start calling them Aminas. They said, we don't like to bring the Aminas over here because they are the ones who are most likely to revolt. They're the ones most likely to engage in escape and maroonage. They're the ones that are most likely to wage war and kill. They even... Some people tried to pass legislation stating that they would not import any quote unquote Aminas or Kuromantis from the continent. They wanted to get other groups, but they did not want to bring those people over here because those were the ones who were always revolting. One of the other reasons they didn't like to bring them, because even if they came, that legislation didn't pass, but even when they did come, one of the reasons that they didn't mind revolting. It's because the whites in offspring, and they even had a phrase for it in the Danish language. They would hear the Akwamu and the other Akam people say, when I die, I shall return to my own land. When my spirit separates from my body, I'm going back to the land of my ancestresses and ancestors. So I don't care anything about dying. I'm not going to be a slave. I'm going to wage war against these Achiwadi for these spirits of disorder, spirits of the white snarl spring. If we win, we take over the whole island and we run our own nation. And now we have a nation in the West and we're going to make trade deals and so forth with our own nation in the East. And we're going to have an empire in the West. But if we don't make it, we're going to kill as many crackers as possible because when I make my transition, if they kill me, then my spirit is going right, right back to my ancestresses and ancestors, my ancestral village, and I will be reborn through Bebra right back in my village. You can never control me. You can never tame me. I don't fear death because I'm going back to my village. And they knew that, in fact, the title of this chapter in this book is called, quote, when I die, I shall return to my own land because they feared that sentiment that our people had. So this is why some of them tried to pass legislation to not bring Akan, quote-unquote, slaves into the Western Hemisphere because they were too dangerous. Now, what happened was they waged war. They took over the island under King Jama or Jam, misnomer King John, because there was actually a fracturing within the rebellion, within the rebels and so forth, because remember, there were mainly Akwamu, but then some of them were Ga. Some of them were Adangbe, some of them were from other groups, and some of them remembered when King Jamma was a military officer in the Akwamu Empire, and when the Akwamu were controlling them in the past, just a few years ago. Now they're all stuck on the same boat, quote unquote, because they're all enslaved, but they remember when they were heavy handed with regard to them. So they didn't want to be up under him, so to speak. So some of them actually defected 
You have a few who defected, went over to St. Thomas and told the whites now spring and even joined to assist to put down the rebellion. There was a split. And that's just a lesson for us. We can't treat each other wrong because it comes back to bite us and so forth. And that has been on a number of occasions, true story. Some were like that. So there was a fracturing that took place. Eventually, the rebellion fell apart within six months. They held the island for six months. They were running their own nation for six months. They were still planting and so forth. But then it fell apart, and they were taken down. But let's read a, a little portion. Just want to pull it up real quick. Here's the key. They said, however, several were warned by loyal Negroes, talking about warning the planters, who saved them from this quote unquote treachery. Panette, which was the French individual who was eyewitness at the time, through the capture of the fort, the massacre of several planters, and the plunder of the houses of those whom terror had forced into flight. The rebels had armed themselves with guns, swords, sabers, gunpowder, and lead. In addition to the cutlasses they had made out of iron hoops and other weapons made of bows and axes. So they were talking about they waged war and so forth. What ended up happening was once it was laid down, once the rebellion was put down and so forth, instead of allowing themselves to be captured, King Chama or Njama, what he said was, we're not going to be captured. The royals committed suicide because remember, they would always say, if I die or when I die, I will return to my ancestral land. They committed suicide. So it was done. Their spirits left the body and the whites in our spring, they tried to recapture, you know, the control that they had. Here's the key with regard and the segue now to the actual root piece. This is King, quote unquote, John, his highness, John, or high John, the conqueror, who was literally the conqueror. This is the African king they're talking about. Now we're going to get into the nature of this root, the original root, what it actually is before the John root was used, what it actually is, and the direct connection. When they said in the stories of the quote unquote, what they would call myths, but the stories of High John the Conqueror, when he said when he died, his spirit would go into the plant, and then you can use that plant to communicate with him. Here's the key. In the Akan language, what does the name Njama mean? Njama, the name of the individual, the name of the king. Jama, which is corrupted into John and Joan and June and so forth. The name in Jama is actually, or Jama is the name of a plant in ancient, in Ghana. It's a creeping plant, a climbing plant in Ghana. Just like we have animal totems associated with our clans, the Asona Abusia, there are seven clans, matric clans in our Khan culture, headed up by seven great ancestresses and governed by seven female Aboson, female divinities. If you're not descended from one of those seven women, then you are not a Khan genetically. Each one of those clans have animal totems, that chine bois. They have specific plant life and mineral life associated with them. For example, the Asona Abusia, the Asona clan, the major chine bois or animal totem is the white crested raven, which is the black raven, white collar and so forth. When we get over here in America, the raven is that same totem and people who are Asona people they will send the Nsamampo, the ancestors of the ancestors will send that black, not only the raven, but you're, if you're in a region where there are no ravens, they will send a bird that's in the same family, which is the black crow. So whenever they need to communicate with you, they will send that animal totem and bring their ancestral energy to bring you messages, to guide you and so forth, protect you, warn you, and everything else. Uh, the Great Bre- clan, the symbol or the animal totem is Osebo, the leopard. It's a major totem. When we get over here to the Western Hemisphere, there are no leopards here. But if they want to communicate, they will utilize a feline uh, animal, which is a cat, a certain kind of cat that carries that same kind of energy. And they would direct that cat, whether it's a stray cat or not, 
to show up at specific times to sh- warn you and so forth, just like they use the bit cat, the Osebo, the leopard on the continent. But they also send the Osebo, the leopard in dreams and so forth. Every clan, whether it's a matric clan or patric clan, has animal totems associated with it, plant, mineral, and so forth. We are governed by specific abosome. Each one of those abosome govern plant life, animal life, mineral life, and afurakani, afurakani, human life. So the matric clan deities and the patric clan deities, they have their own animal totem. They have their own totems with regard to plant life as well as mineral life. And they're categorized as such. So if you have a, if you're a child of a fiery divinity and you carry the fiery energy of that abosom into into the world, then there's a specific class of animals that carry that same fiery energy. That's your animal totem. It's a specific class of plant life that carries that same fiery energy. That's the plant totem connected with you. There's a specific class of mineral life that carries that same fiery energy, and you all all are categorized under that abosom. If you're a child of a water divinity, then there's a specific class of watery um, plant life, as well as animal life, mineral life, maybe fish or whatever it is um, connected with that, or a sea um, serpent or eel or different things, whatever it is, you're connected to that. You're categorized under the energy complex of that of both zone, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and human life, afurakani, afurakani, human life only. King or Jama, his name literally is the name of that plant, that creeping plant. So when they said he died and his spirit would go into the plant, Jama literally means that plant, means that plant, that creeping plant with that root. So his spirit was in that plant. So when they talk about his spirit was in a root, that's a literal thing. It's not, cos- it's not mythological. And it can only be defined in our Khan culture. Because the exact true historical figure who became John the Conqueror, Jamma the Conqueror, and Jamma the Conqueror, who said when he died, his spirit would go into the plant. That is the King John. He was a king. He was a Sapohini, the warrior king, or the king of the soldiers, and so forth. He did wage war, led to rebellion, overthrew the island, the greatest victory up until that point, until the Haitian Revolution, 60 years plus years later. He did everything that the great king they talked about did, but then they committed suicide because they were not going to be controlled by the whites in their offspring. They were not going to allow themselves to be controlled. He didn't allow himself to be controlled when he was forced into that plantation. They arrived in 1733 in June. They started the rebellion in November, took over the island for six months. They only had a few months to plan. They got right to business, took over a few months later, ran it for six months. When they saw that it was over with, then they took themselves out. But the plant that they talk about in the story of High John the Conqueror, who he said his spirit would go into the plant, that is the plant totem that he is actually named after, the Njama or Jama plant in Ghana. Key. Now, that particular plant in Ghana did not exist in the West Indies. So what plant did they have to substitute with once they got over here? And we're going to get into some etymology etymology, so you can see what is this high John the Conqueror root, or as it's properly pronounced when you hear blues singers like Muddy Waters or Old Diddley or whoever say, I got my conga root or conquer root, they say, oh, well, he's trying to say conqueror root, but he's just contracting it to conquer root. I got my Johnny conquer root or Jama conquer root. No, actually, they were saying it properly because this term exists exactly in that form in Akan for the specific root that we're talking about. Now, the plant, the Jama plant, that King Njama is named after, that his spirit not only went into after death, but his spirit was already part of when he was born because it, that, so he was named literally after the plant. That is the true high Jama conqueror root when he was born on the continent. But when we come over here and that plant doesn't exist, 
then we have to find a plant directed by the albosome and the unsamon for what plant carries the same energy over here that it doesn't exist, that exists over here, but does not exist on the continent. Or since we didn't have the Njama plant here, what is the, another plant species that carries the same kind of energy, just like the animals? The same is true of divination. When we would normally use Nsedewa, cowrie shells from that marine animal, the shell of that specific marine animal, we use those cowrie shells from that animal to do divination, to engage in adebisa on the continent in Akan culture, certain forms of divination. Once we were forced into North America, we had access to that marine animal, and therefore we didn't have access to cowrie shell. So what will we use for divination in that kind of adebisa, that form of divination, that process? Well, the albosome led us to another marine animal a bivalve marine mollusk, which is typically called a clam, and, and the seashells that you would say in the north, seashell, and the south and other parts, they will call them cockle shells, C-O-C-K-L-E, cockle shells. We use seashells for divination from that specific marine animal because they carry the same energy, a uh, related energy complex. So we didn't have the cowrie shell when we got over here, so they directed us, the abosom direct us specifically to go into the uh, sea, go to the beach, grab those shells and so forth, consecrate them and utilize them for divination. And that's what we began to do. And the divination is effective. And we've been doing that for hundreds of years. The same thing with the animal totems, the akine bois. If you don't have the osebo, the leopard over here, or the jata, the lion over here, they will send specific cats. If you don't have the white crested raven over here, in the region you are, they will send the black crow. If you are a child of uh, Asenia clan and the Apan, the bat is your animal totem, then there are certain kinds of bats here, so you can still, they will still send that kind of bat, or whatever species of bat over here. If there was a falcon totem on the continent, that Akroma totem, and there wasn't a falcon in the region where you are, that red-tailed hawk over here carries a similar energy complex and the abosome will manifest through that red tail hawk and use that to communicate with you directly in real time. So the same is true of the plant life, the Njama root that he was named after, that his spirit was connected to, literally, that plant did not exist over here. So when they came over here and they wanted to utilize the same kind of ritual practice, they didn't have that kind of plant in St. John's or St. Thomas. But what did they have in St. John and St. Thomas? They found there was a specific root there. And remember, he had Okomfo. We read a, a number of different um, people that were with him who were enslaved. Some of them said witch doctor, Okomfo, Kumina, and so forth, Abosompo, um, medicine men, and so forth. It wasn't just those kind of royals, but there were also medicine men with them, Okomfo and Abosompo, and so forth. They found that this specific root they recognized that existed here that they also had on the continent. That specific root that had been reintroduced to West Afuraka, Afuraikai, by the Europeans in the forts beginning in the 1500s. We say reintroduced because it had been on the continent for a couple of thousand years in ancient Kemet. Then once the Arabs took over and they began the, the trans. Uh, Saharan quote unquote slave trade and Arab slave trade and so forth. When they were going through North Afrika, Afrika during the spice trade, when the Arabs were running the spice trade, especially in the 13th and 14th century and so forth, one of the spices was that particular root and they had it there. And then we had it in the ancient empire of Ghana when we were in the north. And then some people still had it when they migrated from the ancient empire of Ghana down towards the region of the forest belt of Ghana and Ivory Coast, the regions of those areas today. So some people still had it, but then when the Portuguese came and set up their forts in the late 1400s into the 1500s, the major supplier of this route was the West Indies, and they began to bring it not only to Europe, but into West Afuraka, Afuraikai in abundance. And that particular route is what we call ginger, that ginger root that was brought major production in the West Indies 
They were the major supplier. It originates in India. It was in Afrakaprakai for thousands of years. But then once the Arabs were running the, the spice trade and so forth, they were suppliers. But then when it was introduced into the West Indies, that became the major supplier in the late 14, the early 1500s and so forth. Cortez brings it and so forth into the 1500s, and the West Indies becomes the major supply. And then the Portuguese are taking it from the West Indies and bringing it to West Africa, Africa into the forts. And when they're trading with our people in the forts, they have that spice as well as others, what they would call spice in abundance. So that particular spice or that herb, that root, began to be used by our people. It was already used to a lesser extent because we had it for a long time, but it began to be used in abundance because it was brought in abundance through trade and it became ubiquitous throughout the area. What is the name of that root in the Akan language? Now we're going to get into some etymology to prove conclusively that this John the Conqueror root or the Conqueror root, not Conqueror root, but it's literally as Bo Diddley and Muddy Waters and everybody else would say, the Conqueror root. What is the name of ginger in Akan? It's called, if you, it's two different words together. One word is kanka, also pronounced in the other dialect is keka. So one dialect is keka, one dialect is kanka. Just like it, you have the female name for Wednesday, akua, the Fanti pronounce it ekua. You say afua in Asante, the Fanti say efua. You say for a woman of high status, Awura in Asante, the Fanti say Ewuraba. You say Oba, which means woman in the Asante dialect, O B A A, and the first A is high, Oba, Oba. The word for woman in the Akwamu dialect is Obea, so there's a shift between the A and the E. Oba, Asante dialect. Obea, Akwamu dialect. Akua, Asante. Ekua, Afua a Friday-born female, Asante, Efua, Fanti, Awura, a woman of high status, Ewura, Ba, a woman of high status in Fanti. So there's a shift between the E and the A, and you'll find that throughout the continent or throughout the Akan dialects, there's that shift. So one pronunciation is Keka, the other pronunciation is Kaka. That's the first piece. And then Nduru, meaning medicine, is the second part of the word. Nduru, meaning medicine, from roots, trees, branches, but also to become heavy with the spirit. In the Asante dialect, it's Nduru, but in the Akwamu dialect, it's Ndu. So Asante is Nduru, and in in Akwamu is Ndu. And as we proved in our book, it is the Akwamu dialectical variant of the term Ndu, medicine, and also from roots, trees, branches, plants, and undu to become heavy with the spirit. It's the Akwamu dialect that came to North America and is used as the name of the religion, Hudu. It's not Huduru, it's Hudu from the term undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life, and so forth. So Kanka Duru became Kanka Du and Akwamu. That is the word for ginger. Kankaru, Kankaru, K-A-K-A-D-U, in the Asante dialect, K-A-K-A-D-U-R-U. They would say Kankaduru or Kekaduru. We would say Kekadu or Kankaru. So the root, ginger root, is called Kankaru, K-A-K-A-D-U. Kankaru. So when they said, I have my conquer root, I mean my conquer root, and when who do say I'm using John the Conqueror, and they say, well, in the Southern dialect, what they're really trying to say is John the Conqueror root, and they can't say it properly, so they're saying Kancheru or Conqueror. No, ginger is called Kancheru in Akan. What does it mean, however? We know what Ndu, the second part, means medicine. What does the first part, Kanka or Kenka, mean? And here's what pulls it all together. Three different definitions. 
Kenka or Kanka to bite. Kenka or Kanka to touch, but also to feel, to grow. Kenka or Kaka, irritability, but fierceness, ferocity, an idiom, Oye Kaka. He is fierce, wild, unruly, intractable, quarrelsome, untamable, irrepressible. So the kenkaduru or kankaru is that plant that you bite, kenka or kanka, that you touch or grope, kanka, that makes you fierce, full of ferocity, unruly, untamable, irrepressible. What do we say about High John the Conqueror? I'm chewing my root. For court cases, you chew the root, meaning kanka, you bite it, to bite, kanka. Kankaru, biting medicine. Kanka ndu, or kanka hudu. To touch, to grow. I'm rubbing my root. When the waters of Bodhidli is saying, I got my kanka root and I'm rubbing my root. I'm rubbing it for ritual practices to, to invoke really the unsanfo and our both zone to make something happen. Kanka also means to touch, also to grow. When they say John the Conqueror, his spirit will come to you because he was untamable. He was irrepressible. He was ferocious. He led the war, and he would not allow them to control him, even to the point where he would commit suicide. Kanka means fierceness, ferocity, untamable, irrepressible, intractable. So the three definitions that are associated with the root, chewing the root, rubbing the root, and it makes you ferocious and untamable, kanka to bite, kanka to touch, to grow. Kanka, fierceness, ferocity, untamable, irrepressible. Kankaru is the hoodoo or the undu that makes you, that you use to bite. Kanka, to touch or rub. Kanka, that makes you untamable, irrepressible. Kanka. Kankaru is the name of ginger. They had kankaru, that's what it was called back then. That's what it's called right now. When King Njama or Njama Jam was an Akwamu, a Safohini, warrior, king or warrior leader on the continent. When they engaged ritual practice, Kankaru was one of the medicines that they had right there in Ghana. When they were forced into the Western Hemisphere, they noticed that even though the Njama plant, the creeping plant that he was named after, that his spirit was part of, didn't exist over here, but to their delight, they saw that Kankaru was here, the same plant that they use ritually. These Okompo priests and priestesses, Obosompo priests and priestesses and medicine men and so forth, Odun Sinifo, Odumafo, that came over with them, that were enslaved with them, they saw the exact same root that they had been using to bite, to chew for ritual practices, to rub for ritual practices, to make people fiery and fierce and ferocious and untamable that they used to invoke the Yabosum and invoke the Nsumampo, the exact same root that they used to use on the continent. To their delight, they found the exact same root here. And they began to use the Kankaru here. And that's the root over here that King Jamma, the High One, His Highness, High Jamma or High John, King John or King Joan, as they called him, as the Danes called him, King John, the conqueror, that's the root, the conqueror root that he used. That's the conqueror root that he talked about his spirit would go into. That root, by the way, here in North America, is a root that we give to the Nsamampo on our shrines, that we give to the Abosom on our shrines as our Khan people practicing hoodoo in North America. That's the root that we give to our direct blood ancestors, especially those of us who are Akwamu, King Jama or Njama is our blood relative. They forced him into the Western Hemisphere. Of course, all Akan people are related, but specifically with regard to Akwamu people, this is our direct blood relative. We've been giving him Kankaru ever since we've been here. 
So when we talk about High John the Conqueror, when we talk about Asato Hene in Jama, we give him Kankaru because he directed us to give him Kankaru. We've been doing that. That's part of our ritual practice. We know exactly who he is. He's a direct relative of ours. So we have representation of him on our Nkomre, on our shrine, because we know him directly as a family member, have always known who he is from the beginning. And he's always directed us to use that kankaru or that ginger. Now, how did that whole notion of the story get up into the southern United States? Of course, remember, he was brought in 1733. They started the rebellion a few months later in 1733, in November. And then it lasted for a number of months, up and through up until about June of 1734, and then it fell apart. And then later on, they committed suicide, and that was it. That great story of the greatest rebellion where they took over the whole island had never happened before during enslavement up to that point. That story was held and told in the blood circles of the Akan, who were down there in St. John and, of course, St. Thomas a few miles away. But, of course, it spread throughout the Caribbean. But there was one individual who was very significant who brought that story from St. Thomas Island because he was born in, on St. Thomas Island. Eventually, he purchased his freedom, and he, Okunfo Kwabena, warrior Kwabena, who was Akan as well, he migrated up to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. That was Denmark Vesey. He was Akan. They call him Kuromanti. That was a euphemism for Akan. Born on St. Thomas Island. Directly blood related to King Yama and the other Akwamu and Akan people who waged war. He was born on that island, St. Thomas, four miles away from St. John. Everybody on St. Thomas and St. John, all the quote unquote enslaved Akan people, they were proud of the fact that their relative Yama Asako Hini Jama had led the rebellion that took over. They also knew about giving him that kankaru, that ginger root, that kankaru that they had been using on the continent. That was the plant, that was the root that he directed them to utilize and so forth. Akunfo Kwabena, when he purchased his freedom, as a young man, he went up into Charleston, South Carolina. For those who don't know who Akunfo Kwabena or Denmark VC is, he organized the largest rebellion in the trustery of America. They were going to overthrow and take over the entire city of South Carolina. Over 9,000 people were in on the conspiracy. What happened and the planning and so forth, the organization. At the end of the day, they were ratted out by some sellout Negro. So it didn't come together the way they wanted it to come together and the quote-unquote conspirators were killed. But once again, they didn't mind sacrificing quote unquote, their lives because they came from the Akan tradition. O Kumpo Kwabena, a warrior Kwabena, so-called Telemake or Denmark Visi, he knew as an Akan, just like other Afurakani, Afurakani people knew, once you kill me, my spirit will go back to my clan, will go back to the land of my Nsamanto, so I don't worry about dying. They say he was inspired by the Haitian Revolution. He was born 30 years after the uh, revolt on Cinnamon, uh, in Cinnamon Bay, which is in St. John's Island. He was born on St. Thomas, four miles away. He was born in that community. His relatives of that community were part of that revolt and so forth. He was born into that. He knew about the Kankaru. They utilized the Kankaru and so forth. And then he migrated as a young man. He won a lottery and purchased his freedom and migrated to South Carolina. In fact, he became a free person of color in South Carolina, but he wanted to wage war and end in slavery. They say he was inspired by the Haitian Revolution because by the time he was a grown man, the Haitian Revolution had taken place. He was inspired by that. But first and foremost, he was inspired by his own ancestor. King Njama, right from the place where he was from, who had taken over the entire island 
and the same ancestors that they have been communicating with ever since he was a child through the Kankaru, the so-called ginger, the Kankaru, and so forth. So he's the one who comes from the same region, goes up into South Carolina. Of course, they organized the, the great conspiracy to overthrow White Narrow Spring. They had a contingency plan that came out in later court records that if they were not successful, they were going to poison the water supply and kill everybody in the city. That shook the White Narrow Spring to their core. That's one of the critical events that led to the end of enslavement because they realized that we were engaged in chemical and biological warfare. Even back on St. John's Island, the White Canal Spring had to put forward specific codes. They decided to set up slave codes and set up 17 very repressive codes and so forth. And the reason why they set them up is because of the things that we were doing, including poisoning planters and so forth. So they had codes about if you ran away or if you um, helped someone run away, you would get burned with hot irons, and then one of your legs would be cut off. If you ran away and got caught, then one of your legs, entire legs would be cut off. Or you would be tied to a wheel and your body broken up on the wheel, you'd be burned with hot irons and so forth, all these different things. If you were found to be um, poisoning uh, a plantation owner, you would be burned with hot irons, and then your leg would be cut off or you will be split apart, tied to a wheel, and your body broken apart, and so forth. The reason they put those codes in place, because there were so many people escaping and having maroon settlements, but we were also using chemical and biological warfare to kill these plants. The same thing happened in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. One of the contingency plans that didn't get to be placed in full effect was they were going to poison the water supply and kill everybody in the city if they were not successful. And the White Canal Spring, when they saw that, they didn't even release that information publicly in the court documents. They were too fearful that some of our people would get wind of that and begin to implement that on a large scale. That didn't come out until much later when historic, historians began to research and look at the court documents and realize that they did not release that information publicly, but it was in the court record. That was one of the critical junctures that switched this whole thing around. 1822 is when he gets killed. Okunpo Kwabena, warrior Kwabena, Denmark BC, so-called. A few years later, of course, Okunfo Yao, Nat Turner, wages war against the crackers and massacres the crackers, and that shakes the crackers to their foundation. The Gullah Wars are taking place. That leads to the Civil War and our people fighting and killing as many crackers as possible, forcing the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. But the key is that whole notion of King John, Jamma, the one who's named after that plant, the spirit's connected to the plant. But because that plant wasn't here, they utilized the plant that they had been using on the continent named Kankaru, continued to use the Kankaru in the West Indies, in the Danish West Indies. They brought that knowledge up into the northern, into North America and so forth, but people who are Akwamu in North America were already using the Kankaru as well, because we didn't just come directly to the West Indies. That was just, that, that was the key with regard to King John, which they call King June or King John, to identify this Akwamu leader, Ohini, Asakohini, who became known as King John or High John, but really King John, the conqueror, we wanted to identify who he is and why he's connected to his spirit being inside of a plant, because Inyama literally means a plant, and that was his, literally his totem, but they substituted that with the Kakaru, and this is why we still call it Kankaru today. Now, there were other Afrakani people who are Khan who were forced into North America and never went to the Caribbean. Sometimes they took us directly to North America, or directly to places like Mississippi, would break our people and send us to the Caribbean, or sometimes they would send us to the Caribbean, try to break us there, and then send us up to North America. Or sometimes they would just take us directly to North America, and that's it. Sometimes they would take us directly to the Caribbean or South America or Central America and just leave us there as well. So Akan people who are Kwamu, who are using Kankaru, 
as well as other Akan people as well, using Kankaru, the healers, the Okonfo, Abosonfo, Odumafo. Once they were forced into North America, they continued to use Kankaru because they found it here as well. It wasn't as popular up in North America as it was in the West Indies, because that's, that was the major producer at that time. But it was here as well. So when they had access to it, they would use that Kankaru, and that's why they called it that. Some of our people ended up in New Orleans, in the region. You had We talked about the uh, Count Coop uh, conspiracy, 1795, and prior to that, the Mina Rebellion in 1791 in New Orleans. That Mina Rebellion was led by Akan-speaking people, but there were other groups as well. But they were led by Akan-speaking people. We did a broadcast of 1791 Mina Rebellion in New Orleans. We, there was also the Count Coop. Uh, conspiracy, 1795, and so forth, a large icon presence there. There was a major um, rebellion in New Orleans uh, with 500 people marching towards the capital city to take over New Orleans and so forth. That took place in uh, Louisiana. So our people who are connected to Louisiana and also further west in Texas, they also came in contact with the usage of the Jala route. At that time, native to South American parts of, you know, uh, Mexico and so forth, that Jalapa root, which became utilized as a substitute for that ginger root and became utilized as uh, High John the Conqueror root. And they're different. You have the High John, quote unquote, root, which is like a purgative. Then you have the Low John, which is uh, the one that you chew and so forth that became a substitute for those who got connected further west. But those who came directly from the continent and were already using Kankaru, which is ginger, they continued to use Kankaru in North America. Those who were forced into the West Indies and they found Kankaru in the West Indies, they continued to use it there. And people like Akupo Kwabena, Denmark Vesey, who migrated up into North America, of course, not only did he bring that ritual use of Kankaru, along with the people he was connected to. Of course, he would connect with Akan people who were already in North America. They were already using Kankaru as well. But the story of High John the Conqueror, tell that story because it was King John, King John, and King Jamma, who was one of the Akan relatives. He could bring that story directly into North America. Others who came from that area brought the story into North America as well. But he was very prominent because he led the largest organized conspiracy of over 9,000 people in North America that ever took place. So that's why it's key that he was born in St. Thomas. He was raised in that culture for a period, but then he migrated further away. He was with a so-called slave master in Bermuda, so he was able to purchase his freedom and so forth, but he knew the story of King John. And he brought that story to North America as well as other people who brought that story to North America. The key here is, number one, the name of the plant is Kankaru. So when we say Kankaru, we weren't saying Conqueror Root. We were saying the exact same name we've always been saying. Kanka meaning to bite or chew. Kanka meaning to touch or to grow. Kaka meaning fierce, ferocious, irrepressible, untamed. All the qualities all in the same root. When you get the substitute, the Jalapa root, or High John the Conqueror as the way they um, utilize it popularly now, you can't just choose regular quote unquote Jalapa root. The reason you can't is because you, you can, it can make you very ill. So you have to have three different plants. And one of them is not even the same plant. So if you pull up some information, you can Google some information on what people use. with. Re- some people thought it was St. John's wort, which, of course, that's not the plant at all. Some people believe the original plant was the jalapa root or jalapa root, jalap root, which is a form, it's akin to the sweet potato and so forth. That became a substitute. But the original root with the exact same name, Kankaru, from Ghana, brought over here by Akan, well, the knowledge brought over here by Akan people, 
and Akan people here in North America today who are part of that Akan culture, not just Akwamu, but any Akan, we've been using Kankaru the whole time on our shrines, invoking the Abosom with Kankaru, those fiery divinities, but also directly evoking Osapo Henni Njama, because we know who he is as an ancestor, because we're directly blood related to him. So for people who thought they knew who John the Conqueror was, they never knew who he was. They never knew what the real root was, because it can only be defined within our con culture and cosmology. They never knew what real hoodoo is, because it can only be defined in Akan culture, language, and cosmology. When we talk about the Moja and Ejapadie becoming the Mojo and Jack Bali or Jack Ball, when we talk about the uh, rabbit's foot, so-called hare's foot or rabbit's foot in Akan culture, Adanko, the hare, it becomes the rabbit in America, is a hoodoo, is a healer, so when the Akramain in the stories in Akan culture, the Akramain, the dog, is having an issue, and all the animals tell the Akramain, the dog, you need to go see Adanko, the hare, because he has specific kind of undu, which they call den, den, den undu. Den means strong or powerful or hard. Den, den, den means strong, strong, strong. So in Akan culture, they said Adanko, the hare, has the den, den, den undu. He has a strong, strong, strong medicine or hoodoo. Adanko the hare is a hoodoo, quote unquote, man, a hoodoo man, Odumafo. So when we come over here and we have the hare's foot and it's transferred through that transference process from the hare to the rabbit, depending on the area we're at, if we don't have a hare in our, in our region, the Unsumafo would direct us to somebody, an entity in the same energy complex, the rabbit. So when we're given a rabbit's foot, that is the foot of Adanko, the rabbit or the hare, because he has den, 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 undu. He has strong hoodoo. We've been using the term hoodoo in Akan for not just hundreds of years, but thousands, proved in the hieroglyphs of ancient Kemet, as we said and shown, and shown in our book. Whether we talked about that, whether we talked about the term kanche, whether we talked about the term hinti, which is the origin of the term hint and its relationship to blue and so forth in the Akan tradition. All the different terms and all the different, we've done over 26 videos dealing with different aspects of Akan culture, defining hoodoo and so forth, the Akuaba doll, the hoodoo doll baby. The Akuaba literally means Aba, means child, offspring. Akua is doll, the Akuaba doll that looks like an onk, the carved doll with the two arms sticking out. That's the hoodoo doll baby which is translated as Akwa-ba. We have the term Akumpo. Kumpo means priest or priestess. Kumpo became Gumpo or Gufa, the Gufa doctor with the Gufa dust and so forth. We prove that the Kumpo, the priest or priestess in Akan culture with the white clay, the Shirel, as well as the gold dust, as well as the red dust and so forth that they use ritually, is the same Gufa doctor and so forth in Akan. We talked about Joe which is a term to shout or to wail. And we talk about the ring shout or the ring cho or jo, that's Akan jo. And when we dance in the counterclockwise circle in Akan culture for ritual for Akon, for spirit possession, spirit communication, and it's called jo, we continue to call that cho in English, sho in the south, shout in the north, the ring shout dancing in a counterclockwise circle, the same direction as I say, I the Earth Mother and so forth. We've done a number of broadcasts. Every aspect of the Hudu tradition can be found in the language of the Akan with a cosmological foundation, with a direct relationship to Akan deities, Akan ancestresses and ancestors, which cannot be defined outside of the Akan tradition. So we've proven that conclusively, and this piece right here simply further cements that reality. This might be part of an upcoming book. In fact, it's going to be part of the Etchy Sign Ancestry Religious Reversion Journal that we will be releasing on the day of the conference, 
Um, on March 12th here in Washington, D.C., for those who came a little bit later, we have our second annual Etchi Sign Conference, Afurakani Afurakani African Ancestral Religious Reversion, where we deal with ancestral religion born of our blood circles, transcarnational inherited tradition. We are not dependent on anybody outside of our blood circles for our ancestral religious practice. We're not dependent on traveling to the continent to get initiated. We're not dependent on traveling to the Caribbean or anywhere else. We have maintained who do as we have proven for hundreds of years here in North America. We've maintained voodoo for hundreds of years in North America. We maintain juju, which is the original Yoruba tradition born in North America hundreds of years ago, maintained for hundreds of years. We maintain the Wanga tradition, which is Obambo, part of the Gullah constellation, hundreds of years here in North America. The Ngangai or Nganga tradition, which is the Fang tradition, as well as the Congo tradition here in North America in our blood circles for hundreds of years. So we're going to have presenters dealing with different aspects of these traditions, inclusive of divination. Voodoo Queen Kalinda Labat of New Orleans talking about that ancestral voodoo. Louisiana voodoo that existed for hundreds of years before the Haitians migrated, voodoo was already in Louisiana. We'll be dealing with the hoodoo tradition. Mama Mawusi Ashakir will be dealing with the juju tradition, the authentic Yoruba tradition carried in our blood circles here in North America that has been constant, continued, unbroken. We didn't have to travel to Nigeria or Cuba or anywhere else to get the Yoruba tradition. It's always been here form of the Yoruba name, Juju. We've had Juju men, Juju women. Those are the priests and priestesses. Those are the Ia Lorisha, Baba Lorisha, Baba Laos, Ianifa, the Juju men, Juju women. The Okompo and Odumapo and Odunsinifo, Oduyefo, the root workers, root doctors, medicine giving people, people who get possessed and so forth. We've had these Akan men, Akan women, Kanja men, Kanja women, Kanche men, Kanche women, Odumani, which became Hudumani or Hudu man and so forth. That term for a specific kind of healing in the Hudu tradition. We've had priests and priestesses in these traditions the entire time. We've had Voodoo men, Voodoo women, and so forth. We've always had that. So we're going to have our different presenters. The conference is free and open to Afurakani, Afurakani people only. Registration is free but required. Go to the Etchy Sign page for that. The information we talked about tonight, we will go into detail, showing the linguistics, showing the animal totems, showing the plant life, the truth to read. All of that information that we talked about tonight in detail will be part of an upcoming book, inclusive of the book that's coming out on March 12th. So when we talked about the Etchy Sign uh, book that we will give away for free at the conference, after the conference, it will be on our website for purchase as a soft cover. The ebook version will be free, just as all of our 24 books, the soft covers we sell, we print them ourselves, but the ebook versions of our 24 books are free. And so you can, even if you don't have funds, you can download all 24 of our books. The same thing will be true with the Etchy Sign book and this information as well as more articles will be in there as well. So as we said earlier in the show for people who came in late, we've been talking about this for the past few weeks, but now we're at the end of January, this is the deadline for your ad space. So if you would like ad space in the journal, this is the deadline. So you must send us those JPEG files, $25 for a one quarter page, $35 for a half page, and $50 for a full page ad. It's full color, eight and a half by 11 size book. As we said earlier, over the past 12 months, we've had over 3.1 million hits on our website, thousands of downloads a month of our free books. So when you place your ad in our Etchy Sign journal for your business organization or institution, then hundreds of thousands of our people will see it. We did 3 million hits this past 12 months. We're already on track to surpass that. And it's going to, all of our books will be on our website permanently for free. So anybody who places an ad, you place your ad for your business, you're guaranteed to have hundreds of thousands of views um, on your ad because people are going to download the books, read the articles, and so forth. It's going to be free, so they'll be able to see that information. So go to our Etchy Sign page, and Ancestral Religious Reversion page on the website, as well as on Facebook. And you can um, place your um, order for ad space, and 
um, you can send us you see the link for the for the email or the email address to send your actual uh, files, your image. And we need those ASAP because we have to start number one formatting. Or we have to get it ready for print so we can have it printed ahead of time to you know make sure everything is taking place. We have to start the formatting process, putting the articles and everything else together and finishing up some certain things. We want to have it enough time to get everything ready for print so we have it ready for the day of the conference. So um, you can deal with that. And also, for those who came in a little bit later, we are producing a documentary film. We put the trailer out. We're going to put the link in the chat room right now. It's on the, you can see the, of course, on our website, you'll see it. Um, on Facebook, you'll see it. We have a crowdfunding site as well, fundraiser.com, F-U-N-D-R-A-Z-R.com, slash Amaru Kapo underscore Adebisa. The film is Amaru Kapo Adebisa Ajumadi, which translates in English to African American Ancestral Divination Project. We're going to have a number of diviners, Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau talking about hoodoo or voodoo divination in the voodoo tradition, Mama Mausi Ashakir dealing with divination in the juju tradition, ancestrally inherited Yoruba divination right here in North America. We will be talking about the system of divination that we utilize in our Kwamu mind, the Kwamu nation in North America, Akan tradition, utilizing those Nwara or those cockle shell, seashell divination with Nsuro in water, that water divination system with the cockle shells. Um, We'll have Wabet um, Seshat Tutank Wachet dealing with that Ovambo divination, Wanga divination from the Gullah constellation, utilizing that palm leaf divination that comes from Ovambo ancestry, but also maintained here in North America. Rekit Kajara Niyaya Nebethet dealing with the Ngangain tradition, which is the Fang tradition out of Cameroon and Gabon, and that healing practice of divination. Raseki with the key energy, key energy of, that you find in ancient Kemet, but also in the language of the Fang people, F-A-N-G, the Fang people, the divine living energy in Fang tradition is called Ki, K-I, pronounced Ki, and that's the same energy that she utilizes in her Raseki process, Fang ancestral religion, in Gangan tradition, maintained in North America for hundreds of years. So all of us will be in the film. We'll be filming on location in the different cities where their shrines are. We want to begin filming in the early part, second week of February. We are at 3% of our fundraising goal. Yet I say for those who have, who have contributed, once we get to about 20% of the fundraising goal, then we can start the first filming segments on location in New Orleans, in Miami, in uh, Cincinnati, North Carolina, Chicago. We're going to these different places to begin the filming on location, but we need that assistance from the community. So if you support the work that we have done, if you've ever downloaded any of the books or listened to the broadcast and it's impacted you, this is the time to show that support. You, any contribution is welcome. If you'd like to receive books in return for your contribution, just let us know. Of course, we can do that as well. Yet I say to those who have contributed, we've received 25 donations, contributions in the past 17 days. So it's a little about like one and a half contributions per day, so to speak. But in order to get to the 20% mark, we need a few more contributions leading up to February, the first, really second week in February, we want to start that filming process then. So if you like, if you want to, if you support the work we're doing, check out the trailer. It's a nine-minute trailer. If you like what you see, definitely go to the page to support that work. And yet, I appreciate your support. And again, we, we're trying to get that done as soon as possible. So whoever can contribute, please go to the site now. And with regard to that Etsy sign journal, your ad space, we need those JPEG files. This is the deadline. June, uh, January 30th and tomorrow the 31st, this is the deadline because we have to get it going. We had a few people already submit. There were some other people who said they wanted to submit their businesses. 
Some of them wanted the $25 one quarter page ad or whatever. And some wanted the full page $50 ad or the page 35, but they should said definitely they want to do it. Some of you have shown interest, but this is the deadline. We sent a few emails out over the past uh, couple of weeks. And since last Thursday, I think it was saying that the deadline was approaching. This is the deadline now because we do need that time to get everything together um, to make sure we can publish on time because we don't want to get to the point where we don't have the books ready uh, when the conference comes about. So, okay, so there's only three minutes left in the broadcast, so we in the broadcast here. If you have any questions or comments, uh, just hit us up on Facebook, Quasi Icon on Facebook. We have a page specifically for the Edgy Conference. We have a new Hoodoo page, Icon Ancestral Religion in North America. We just created that page yesterday. Um, so, well, actually, Saturday, Miminida. Um, check that page out. Like that page. We'll be posting all new information, inclusive of our videos, broadcasts, all the broadcasts we've done on Hoodoo, which is about 27 um, on different aspects of the Hoodoo tradition, proving that these are Akan, this is the Akan tradition. We have our three books on Hoodoo, Hoodoo People, um, as well as Hoodoo Mind Journal from 13,016. The conference, the Hoodoo Mind Conference, which we have yearly Hoodoo Mind, Hoodoo Nation Festival. And our first one was last in 13,016, so called 2016, well, so called 2015 in the Gregorian calendar. And our year was 13,016. And this past October, it was our year of 13,017. The Whites and their Offspring, it was their year of 2016. So we have the journal for both years. That's our, one of our annual conferences, Etchy Sign and Such Religious Reversion on March 12th. This is the second annual Etchy Sign conference. Um, that's annual as well. And then we have the Ojira Mind Purified Nation conference dealing with nationism, the purification of nationalism, Amanie. That's in June around the summer solstice. So um, you'll see all that information on the website, Facebook. Uh, Twitter, OG.fo, Instagram, OG.fo, YouTube, OG.fo, um, OG.fo, Akan, and Kwesi Akan on Facebook. And, of course, follow us on this page as well. So, again, did I say we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. And, Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Hata.